My goodness. Here we are. You want a cough drop? I'm okay. Thank you, Joe. <laughs> this morning I'd like to talk to you a little bit about a message that laid on my heart heavier towards the end of this week. But I want to try to keep it brief in order to ensure that we have enough time for our congregational meeting following the service today. The title of this morning's sermon is Drawing a Line in the Sand. Drawing a Line in the Sand. I'd like to read to you from St. John's Gospel, chapter 8, verses 2 through 11. The word of the Lord reads, At dawn he appeared again in the temple courts, where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman who had been caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman to death. Now what do you say? They were using the question as a trap in order to have basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, starting with the older ones first until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Creator God, may the words of my lips and the meditations of my heart be pleasing unto you, O God, my rock and my redeemer. You know, it seems that no matter how hard these students of the law and teachers of the law tried to trap Jesus, he was always able to work his way out from under their thumb. Whenever the scribes, <coughs> excuse me, and religious elite of Jesus' day would try to expose Jesus' teachings as heretical, they always, always failed miserably. Jesus had a way with words and an ability to turn the religious elite's own interpretation of the law against them. But this time would have to be different. There was no misinterpreting the scripture that was related to this one. Leviticus 3 Chapter 10 says that no matter what, this woman who was caught in adultery would have to be stoned to death. Would have to be stoned to death, according to the Old Testament law found in Leviticus 3. They caught her, and presumably him, in the act of adultery, and she would have to pay the price. But why not the married man? whom she had had the affair with. Many questions surround the man who is hardly mentioned in the passage. Yet does it not take two to commit adultery? Does it not take two to commit adultery? Many questions surround this. But that's beside the point. She was a homewrecker, the seductress of a married man. What got him off the hook? No one knows what got him off the hook. The scriptures don't tell us. Perhaps he was a man that the teachers of the law had known well. Perhaps he had regularly brought his tithes and offerings to the temple. Perhaps he was a gentleman with good standing in the Jewish community. Who knows? <coughs> Perhaps she was completely innocent and was too scared to say to the married man who had perhaps taken advantage of her, anything. But the point is, 
that a lot of mystery surrounds this biblical narrative, as does many other biblical narratives. Regardless of all the mystery surrounding the event, the law required a stoning. The word of God demanded that she be stoned to death. If you don't believe me, just look up Leviticus 3.10. Anyone who is caught in the act of adultery is to be immediately stoned to death, according to that passage. And just as the married man had used her own body for his pleasure, the religious elite were about to use her life to try to trap Jesus and challenge his teachings of grace, love, and mercy. They brought her in and threw her down on the filthy ground in front of him, interrupting the sermon that he was giving to the crowd that had gathered. I can just imagine how she must have felt as she laid on the ground before Jesus, while others looked at her, laughing and scorning her and scoffing her. It was very clear to the religious elite that they had backed Jesus into a corner. The line in the sand was crystal clear. The woman was a whore. She deserved death and she must be killed. Blood was demanded. I can just hear them as they laugh and smile and scoff and say to Jesus, the word of God clearly states that she must die. What do you have to say about this, Jesus? In all reality, they were not asking Jesus for permission to stone her, were they? No. The real question was, would Jesus approve of her stoning, or would he once again overturn the law in favor of grace? They wanted Jesus to draw a clear line, a boundary between us and them. A line between those who deserve death and those who did killing in the name of God. Oh yeah, Jesus drew a line, but not the line that they had hoped for. <clears throat> now I'm going to take a little bit of liberty here because the Bible doesn't tell us exactly how all of this played out. It just gives us the meat and potatoes of the story. But I can imagine in this story Jesus having compassion on her. The Bible says that he got down on the ground where she was. And the Bible says that he knelt and wrote or drew in the dirt. Now it doesn't say exactly what he wrote or drew in the dirt but I would like to think that he got down in the dirt and drew a line. He gave the scribes and the Pharisees the line that they wanted, the boundary that they wanted, but he did not put the premises behind it that they wanted. I'd like to think that Jesus got down on the ground and drew a line in the sand and said to the scribes and the Pharisees, whichever one of you has never sinned, or, or is without sin, go ahead and let her have it. Throw the first rock. Jesus not only did that once, the scripture tells us that he knelt down yet again and wrote or drew in the sand. I'd like to think that after that first time, maybe a few of them weren't getting it. So he knelt back down again, stuck his finger in and reinforced the line a second time. Finally, the religious elite figured out that they were not going to win and walked off. Jesus then looked at her and said, where did all of them go? Didn't anyone condemn you? Her response, no Lord, they're gone. So Jesus said, neither do I. Go and sin no more. The religious elite wanted Jesus to draw a line in the sand to exclude the sinner woman from the kingdom of God. Let me say that again. The religious elite wanted Jesus to draw a clear line, to set a clear boundary, to exclude the woman caught in adultery from the kingdom of God. But hallelujah, just as Jesus seems to always do in the scripture, 
Jesus doesn't draw a line to exclude the woman from the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. He draws a line to include, glory be to God, the woman in the kingdom of God. Can you say amen, amen. in the house of God this morning? I feel like preaching this morning. Hallelujah. He draws a line. Woo! Glory. I might get Pentecostal this morning. He draws a line. Not to exclude her, but what? To include her. Wow. Hallelujah. Wow. Good stuff. The religious elite finally figured out that they weren't going to get the answer that they wanted, Marty. They were not going to get the answer that they wanted. But rather, Jesus drew the line to include the woman. Jesus... The Son of God, the Son of God chose grace over the law, amen? Chose mercy over the law, amen? amen. Chose love over the law, amen? amen. Chose amen. forgiveness over the law, amen? Amen. 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 Love and forgiveness over punishment. But what about the phrase, go and sin no more? Go and sin no more. <coughs> Pardon me. Many in the church want to use this phrase to pounce on every person that they have a disagreement with. But I want to make two very important points about the statement, go and sin no more. Number one, Jesus not only is a rabbi, but as the Son of God, Stopped this stoning of a woman caught in adultery. Stopping this stoning of a woman caught in adultery was Jesus essentially and literally allowing compassion, mercy, and love to have the authoritative word over the authority of Scripture. Holy smokes. Stop right there. A lot of believers are going to condemn you. If you say that to them, are they not? Nothing takes authority over the Scripture. Well, there is one thing that takes authority over the Scripture, and perhaps that's the one who wrote it, Bob. Jesus Christ Himself takes authority over the Scripture. Amen? Let me say that again. Jesus, not only as a rabbi, but as the Son of God, stopping the stoning of this woman caught in adultery, was essentially and literally allowing compassion, mercy, and love to have the authoritative word over the authority of the Scripture. Over the authority of Scripture. Jesus was indeed teaching a new way. After all, doesn't the word gospel mean good news? Good news? But this new way cost him his life. Point number two. Before sharing the truth in love, or what some in the church might call loving the sinner and hating the sin, which, oh, by the way, is a phrase that cannot be found in the Bible, and I really, really hope none of you use it. Because if you use that phrase, it's really, really easy to push others away and push others out. It's impossible to live that out. But before he tells her to go and sin no more, before he tells her, he shares this truth in love, Jesus makes absolutely certain that the woman knows that he does not condemn her. Let me ask you a question this morning. Could the woman ever stop sinning in her lifetime? No. Can you ever stop sinning? No. Of course not. I'm sure that she missed the mark many, many times after her encounter with the Lord. But I really don't think his words, go and sin no more, are the point of this passage of Scripture. Rather, the point is that Jesus was willing to stand against the oppressor alongside the oppressed, even when she was caught red-handed in the act of sin. My dear friends, the point I'm trying to make today is that Jesus taught us that we must draw lines in the sand 
that will bring people into the kingdom of God, amen, and not leave them out. So many folks today, especially in the church, and you can probably tell I've been through some stuff this week that's affecting the way that I'm preaching this message, but they want to draw lines in the sand to leave people out. And they'll use the Bible as a wedge to do it, won't they? But Jesus taught us not to do that. Jesus taught us to draw lines of inclusion, radical welcome, extravagant welcome, bringing people in, not to turn them away, not to leave them out. So I ask you, I ask you, my dear friends this morning, my loved ones, my brothers and sisters in Christ, what about you? What about me? What about our church? Where will we draw our line in the sand? That's all I have for you today. Before the congregational meeting, would somebody go get Allison and everybody up from downstairs and we'll get ready to get started.